The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and welcome to this live learning event entitled Engineer and Contractor Agree. Chemical grout stops infiltration in large diameter pipe. My name is Don Rigby, Director of Marketing for Avanti International. Today I have the pleasure of introducing you to some pretty savvy people and facilitate this, uh, a session to maximize the next 59 minutes for you. Chemical grout has a long history of restoring underground infrastructure. Today we'll explore how Granite City, Illinois used multiple rehabilitation technologies for structural repairs and chose acrylamide grout to stop infiltration in large diameter pipes. You'll learn directly from our panel of experts who have devoted their professional lives to this industry, enjoy teaching what they know so others can do. The platform we're using has all participants on mute, but it's important that we get interactive, and here's how. You're going to have questions, and that's a good thing. We'll reserve time at the end for Q&A, but I recommend as questions come to mind, immediately type them into the collapsible dialog box to the right of your screen. I suggest you locate that right now. There's a little arrow, um, little orange button up there. If you open that up, you'll see a, a question box. And that's where you submit. And I'm the only one who sees these questions. And as appropriate, I'll interrupt the speaker or choose to reserve it for the end. If we don't get to all the questions on this webcast, We'll answer every question individually by email, and that's a promise. I'm also a clock watcher. And because I respect your time, I'll do my best to end this session in 60 minutes so you'll feel good about joining us in future webcasts. One last bit of information. There will be three interactive poll questions during this session. And these are very interesting because I play back the answers right away, and you'll see your reply and how it stacks up with others. So let's do the first one right now. So I can be ambidextrous and click a couple buttons at the same time. I just launched the first, the first survey. And it asks, you know, what role do you play in the industry? And I'm starting to see how the voting is coming in. We're about halfway there. I'm going to close it in about four more seconds. Still getting some answers. I'm going to go ahead and close it. And now I'll share. Looks like perfectly even distribution between public works and the engineering community. Very nice. Some of the technology vendors I recognize as partners of ours. Thank you for being there, folks. Specialty contractors, good. OK, that's, that's about what I had hoped and expected. Thank you for that contribution. I'm going to close this off. And reactivate the screen. There we go. So let me introduce you to our, our experts today. Steve Osborne is a project engineer with Juno Associates and was the go-to guy for the construction phase of Granite City Project. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Don. Happy to be here. James Bone is the general manager of Vision Sewer of Missouri, formerly Walden Tech, the contracting or the grouting contractor for Granite City Project. He's well versed on all underground construction technologies and big on safety. James, are you ready to share everything you know today? I sure am. Thank you very much, Don. <laughs> and Frank Aguilar is the technical product manager at Avanti, someone I get to work with every day on a daily basis. And he's served Avanti in this capacity for 14 years. Thank you, Frank, for your contributions today. Thank you, Don. Looking forward to this webinar. All right, to start us off, I would uh, like Steve to set the stage and share the history of Granite City. In the area known as the Great American Bottoms, and, and, and if you would, define the problems, Steve, as well as the, uh, the engineered solutions, and I will make you the presenter right now. If you'll click Acknowledge, 
and we'll begin. All right. Hopefully everybody's seeing the screen. Uh, Steve Osborne again. Um, a little bit of history and background about Granite City and its location. Granite's located across the river from St. Louis, Missouri. It's in a unique condition location due to the, the Illinois River, the Missouri River, all combining and coming into the Mississippi River, which creates uh, an old floodplain, alluvial silts and soils. And uh, as we move along here, during flooding, the groundwater comes up, and I don't know if you can see these little blue circles in the Great American Bottoms. That's indication of the groundwater at the same surface elevation. So we get a lot of high groundwaters. And uh, that creates a lot of fluctuating pipe movement, sewer movement. Here's a typical schematic of a sanitary sewer layout. You've got the manholes, the branch lines coming into the main lines, and then all flowing into the waste treatment plant, which outfalls into the rivers. As in Granite City, a lot of our sewers are under groundwater conditions. And you look, the dark blue here shows kind of a typical schematic of that. Here's an aerial photo of Granite City area. Uh, during 93, 94, we had a, a record flood event. And the yellow highlighted areas are the sewers that were under groundwater conditions. And you can see the breaks. Most all of them occurred in the groundwater sewers that were under groundwater conditions. A few in old downtown area were not in groundwater, but older structure or infrastructure. And uh, to indicate more problems in 95, another flood event, not as drastic as 93, but still uh, some flood stages. Uh, we had severe breaks again, and again, concentrating in the uh, groundwater conditions of the sewer mains. Again, in 2010, an increase, mostly in the uh, closer to the river. It's probably a, a rapid flood event more than a long term. So the conditions of the sewers and the groundwater really play havoc. Typical sewer layout, uh, you've got your manholes, your sewer main, your, your lateral connections, and anywhere there's an opening, cracks, joints, uh, even in the sewer laterals, anywhere there's an opening where the groundwater is above that level, you're going to get that infiltration and silts and soils are going to wash in, especially in our area. You know, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Uh, this is an important slide you're going to show. You're not even going to show all of it. So I think there is um, a PowerPoint positioning problem on your slide and your screen. Hmm. If you go to the bottom right of your screen, you'll see okay. the ability to, to move that, toggle that. Uh, go to the bottom right. Mm -hmm. and I believe you'll see a option to change perspective on the PowerPoint. Hmm. Not Down the lower tray, close to the lower tray, just above the tray. See my cursor? No, I don't. Again, we can't see a majority of your screen right now. Okay. Uh, reading view, does that help? Um, slightly, no. I need you to do the, uh, you, you're on the right screen, so I need you to change that. There's a graduated bar at the bottom mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the PowerPoint. Okay. And if you can't see oh. that. How's that? Okay, now we're getting there. If you Marcus. will, no, no, if you hit full screen now, we're still not there. Here's what I'll do. Okay. I'm gonna Take it and run with it. <laughs> yes, sir. No problem. I'm going to get caught up right about here. This is where we are. I will advance the slides when you tell me. Go. OK. The process of the sewer failure, the uh, top screen just shows typical infiltration uh, coming in. And the sands and silts will be washing in with that, but you have no cracks or anything in your sewer main. Stage two, the uh, yellow circle, you're starting to lose soil around the pipe. And the weight of the sewage and groundwater in the excuse me, sewer pipe cause that to start settling and causing cracks in the 12 and 6, 3 and 9 position. Stage 3 is a total failure of the sewer pipe. That's where you get the cracks opened up massively, structural failure of the pipe. Maybe some flow it will go through, but 
not a conducive situation. And usually we see sinkholes at this point in time. Stage one and two can be fixed with chemical grouting or lining before any other major damage occurs. When we reach stage three, it's usually an open cut excavation and a much more expensive repair to deal with. If you would, Don. Yep. I say yes. The effects of infiltration are quite a few, uh, mainly flooding the local uh, streets and residential areas. The back, the sewers can't handle the flow from all the groundwater infiltration, so they're backing up and, and come out of manholes and catch basins. Typical arterial street in Granite City uh, during a rain event, flood event, as you can see quite a bit of flow there. Residential intersection flooded. Here's a, it affects commercial areas. We've got a street intersection at the U.S. Steel industry. And uh, somebody trying to get it opened up and flowing. Uh, a lot of hard work for the public works guys. And it also affects residents more drastically when it gets up into their yards and homes and uh, into their basements. Other, other infiltration effects are increased costs of uh, handling all the groundwater. They've got to pump and uh, maintain and treat that groundwater, which normally you wouldn't have to, so wastewater treatment plants are occurring a lot of cost on that. It reduces your pumps, you know, your life of the, and treatment of your pumps. A lot of increase in sanitary overflows that sometimes get out into the river. Fine soils get washed in. And here's a typical example of silts getting washed in through this our sewers and granite. That reduces your capacity drastically. You'll see even worse in the next slide. There's your river sands. That's uh, happens frequently before we got the chemical grouting going. And the soils can lose so much soil loss that uh, structural failures start to occur. Go ahead, Don. And creates problems around residential areas. Here's some settlement around our residence. Uh, sheds and buildings can start tilting in towards and loss of soil fines. Alleys sinkholes and alleys. Uh, roadways. See the manhole adjacent there. Streets. Why? Every time you see a sinkhole, almost, there's a manhole nearby. Why is that? Well, we found that the uh, sewers, uh, that the water transitions into the sewers and the manholes, follows the sewer mains and gets into the manholes or towards the manholes. A lot of these manholes are brick manholes. They're so basically an open invitation to groundwater to come in and start washing fines in through the manholes. That's a good example. And uh, they can undermine utilities. Here's an example of uh, the undermining getting under water main and eventually caused the water main to collapse and created a, a large disaster in the middle of the street intersection. Another example of that. It affects other infrastructures, uh, railroads. See here some sinkholes under railroad tracks. Here's a, an area that, same area, large diameter sewer, 108, 108 inch sewer that we we're focusing on chemical grouting. You see the large sinkhole here in a rail yard. More street and utility issues. You see the manhole dropped in this location, just all the fines washing through the manhole and the pipes. Fair enough. Fair enough. State route, we had to close part of State Route 3 in Granite City due to sewer failure from infiltration. And then the, uh, one final effect of infiltration is where it creates structural issues with the sewer main. Here's a 96-inch sewer, and you can see the top and the typical 9, 12, six o'clock, three o'clock cracks and breaks. And this was under uh, mainline railroad tracks, but um, starting to show failure. Why do we need control infiltration? Well, obvious is uh, one of the things is to meet federal regulations, but most more importantly to uh, help stop the flooding and, and conditions with residents and commercial businesses and uh, reduce the costs of operating the pumps and treatment. You know, of course, manhole, avoid sinkholes in the streets and alleys. 
and uh, kind of touching again on treatment cost of treating all that groundwater you wouldn't normally have to. And your collection system stays in a good working condition a lot longer if you can stop the infiltration. Thanks for uh, for uh, sharing the pain behind that. And I'm going to make Steve, I'm going to make uh, James the presenter now for this next section. Hopefully, we'll be able to see his screen better than we saw yours. Yes. James, can you acknowledge presentation, please? Yes, just did. Okay. Now, from a contractor's perspective. What do we have? Rehabilitation technologies. We've got uh, complete sewer failures. We're going to discuss dig and replace. Uh, here's a good slide. Uh, seen this earlier with the sinkhole that Steve had. This is a excavation with a sewer failure right in between two houses. You've got about 10-foot area between these two houses. That gentleman, that sewer line is about 12 foot deep. This here is an ocean nightmare on top of everything. No trenching, no shoring, or no shoring with the trench box, anything like that. Uh, big safety issue here. Uh, no type of sheeting to go and protect the house from moving. Uh, just big headaches. Uh, no uh, dewatering. Luckily, this isn't too bad of an area here. Uh, here we got another one, uh, utilities. It affects other than just the sewers. They've got the uh, Ameren, the local power company out here, stabilizing a power pole. Here you see they've got sheets put in. They've got uh, trench boxes and such. Uh, we've got dirt out in the street. We're closing the streets down. Uh, another setup here. We've got the whole street shut down, trench boxes in place, dewatering setup huge social disruption for the residents in these areas. When the excavators come in, people get excited. Uh, again, another slide quick showing dewatering in place, the trench boxes set up for OSHA requirements. Huge excavation here. This was a 30 or 36 inch pipe, I'm believing what had failed. Uh, we've got uh, like I say, a huge excavation, dewatering here. Uh, slope back. Uh, at the lower part of the screen here where my arrow is, that's actually a water main there going over top of. And that's a fairly large diameter water main. Uh, here, this is a good slide. This is Granite City without dewatering uh, due to the high groundwater table, the alluvial sand. It basically turns into quicksand. Uh, by, or I keep saying bypass, but the uh, uh, dewatering pumps get shut off. This is what you end up with very quick in the whole American Bottoms area. Uh, you've got to get the water out of the way so the contractors can dig. Again, another just whole street shut down, dewatering set up, boxes. Uh, here, at least, we're not out in the street, but uh, again, dewatering the boxes. This here's just a picture of a well point that. Uh, some of the contractors prefer to use around here, uh, setting the points. Okay, what other rehab areas? And these here three were used on the Granite City: slip lining, cured in place lining, and spiral wound. Uh, here's a picture of slip lining. Uh, slip lining is not truly trenchless, as you must have some type of an insertion pit. Uh, you cut, excavate down, open up top of the pipe. You can actually go and keep flow going through under certain circumstances, and then you just start slipping the pipe into the existing. Uh, you're kind of restrained by how bad the pipe is deflected in other areas and how big a pipe you can run through. You're going to downsize. There's no questions on that. Uh, again, using excavator, slipping the pipe in. Here, uh, you can tell with the PVC going in as a slip line, this line here is being reduced a huge amount. But engineer study, this uh, PVC would handle what the flow was. So uh, it just made it easier than having to go and dig up. I believe this was by rail tracks. Get another picture showing the uh, slip line PVC and the larger diameter. 
believe this was about a 15 inch PVC and about a 24 or 27 inch line. Okay, cured in place. This here slide, uh, it's a 48 or 54 inch diameter sewer main. Uh, liners showing up here in a refrigerated trailer. They're preparing to start the inversion at this point. Uh, further on, you see the blue area of the liner there going down in the hole. That's a resin impregnated liner coming off the reefer unit. Uh, cured in place, you're going to have to go and bypass the whole system while you're installing that stretch. Get another picture of the liner being inverted in using water out of the reefer unit. Spiral wound, SPR. This here picture is where Steve was showing earlier of the 96 inch line of the guy standing in it. That guy was actually six foot tall. That line has deformed that much. Uh, nice thing with spiral wound, it's a single piece. It's uh, welded or clipped together depending what process. Uh, they can adapt it to size. This uh, spiral wound was actually uh, was two different diameters going through when it was done. Once the spiral wound is in place, uh, you bulkhead it and grout in the annual space with a cementitious non-shrink, flowable fill, something like that. Another picture of the spiral wound being installed. Um, you can do this with minimal flow in the line. Uh, but when you start getting in there, grouting it in place, you're going to be bypassing around and such as that. Okay, we've talked about structural repairs to this point. Now, we'll talk about repair and preservation, maintenance, chemical grouting. Chemical grouting is actually a maintenance item. It does not provide a structural repair. It provides sealing and stabilization. Chemical grouting is a multi-component chemical grout it's pumped into voids around pipes, manhole structures, and it's designed to go and stop infiltration, exfiltration, stabilize the soil, stabilize the pipe, and it can be used to seal the annular space between the hose pipe and liner. A lot of projects are being put out right now to go and grout the laterals as part of uh, lining. This here is an injection of uh, grout, uh, drill and inject at a, using urethane. Uh, here's a post picture of that same. Big thing here is your only quality control, quality assurance is visual. You cannot air test doing manual injection. Here we are set up with a grout rig and our large diameter uh, grouting support unit uh, for doing packer grouting. Using the packer, and this is a picture of a 108 inch diameter packer uh, signed and built by Logiball for us for this project. Uh, you can actually pressure test the joints, ensure that they pass, fail beforehand, pump your grout, do your repositioning, retest to ensure quality control. Uh, here's another picture of the 108 inch packer in operation. Uh, guys are actually standing on boards. There's about 12 inches of flow through the line. This is done during active flow. Where my pointer is now, you see a white band there. That is the grout band a little excess grout that was uh, left on the inside uh, as part of the grouting thing uh, operations. Uh, here's a picture of the unit. We basically took a 48 foot reefer unit, semi uh, trailer control temperature device, and built operation into it a 120 gallon grout mixing capacity inspector's desk, hardwired communication. At all times, the inspector was in this trailer seeing exactly what our operator was seeing, hardwired communication to the grout operator in the truck and the men in the line. This also had all our confined space safety equipment, rescue equipment, supplied air, everything needed to go and uh, keep this job running. This job was running five days a week, 12-hour shifts, uh, 24 hours a day. Also contained a coffee pot to keep the inspectors awake. <laughs>
And that, uh, James, that was just that was just a grouting operation, right? That was just a grouting operation, yes, sir. Okay. I have a question, a live question coming in that I wanted uh, probably Steve to respond to, uh, and then I will do the second poll question. But Steve, the the rehabilitation was it citywide, or was it in fact targeted to those areas that were most impacted by high groundwater? It was targeted to towards those areas most impacted by the high groundwater conditions. The other sewers not in groundwater, you know, uh, are doing well, but the, the groundwater fluctuations just really play havoc on the sewers. And we saw all kinds of technologies were going to work. We're going to go do a deeper dive into grouting here in a minute. Let's take a look. Let's do one more quick poll question. I launched it here for your benefit. What is your experience level with chemical grout? This is just for our information. I'd like to play it back to everybody. When I see these uh, responses coming in, they're coming in fast. We're about 25% of the way there. We're now knocking on the door to 70%. You know what? I'm going to wrap this up in another couple minutes, seconds. I'm sorry. And I'm going to close it and share it. Interesting. I have got a button in the way for me seeing some of these answers, but interesting. Folks, thank you. I uh, appreciate that. I'm going to hide this. And I will now make Frank Aguilar the presenter. And Frank, if you would please. Um, if you could discuss a few fundamentals of chemical grout and the focus specifically on acrylamide is that was the grout chosen by the Granite City Project. Do you have uh, this moment? Do you have full presentation power? I do. Well, welcome. There are many trenchless technologies in the marketplace today. I'm going to focus on acrylamide grouting. As you see from this list, there are various types of chemical grouts primarily foams and gels. Hydrophilic foam grouts are flexible when they cure. They do not require catalysts. They are water cured, and they are injected pretty much at a one-to-one -one ratio. A hydrophobic grout is a product that, when it cures, it's semi-rigid to rigid. It does require a catalyst. It is injected as a one-to-one -one component and it can go through wet and dry cycles. Another family of grouts is the chemically active grouts. And that's where acrylamide falls into. Acrylamide is the thinnest product on the market. It has a centipoise of one to two centipoise. The centipoise of water is one. It is a true solution product. It is injected at a one to one ratio with adjustable cure times. You can either do it chemically or you can do it using additives. We will focus on acrylamide for the remainder of the presentation. Here you have the grout side, component A, and the catalyst side, component B. Blue and yellow tracer dyes have been added for visual purposes. This represents component A, or the grout side, and component B, the catalyst side, being mixed together at the point of the grouting zone. When component A and B are mixed together, it will result in a cured mask. The green color reflects a proper mix has occurred. Typically, the reaction time is approximately 20 to 25 seconds. With a controllable set time of up to 10 hours and being the thinnest product on the market, it gives you the capability to inject and to permeate various types of soil strata. This chart gives you viscosity ranges of various chemical grouts in the market today. 
you'd see acrylamide has a one to two centipoise, acrylate has three centipoise, silicate six centipoise, and so on. You'll see that water, again, has a centipoise of one. What we like to say is wherever water can enter into, then you can inject acrylamide through. Life expectancy. Acrylamide grout has a half-life of 362 years based on the Department of Energy study from 1992. Acrylamide ground is in the middle of the pack in reference to cost. Cements are generally the most inexpensive. These costs reflect retail pricing from suppliers. Acrylamide grounds have been successfully used to stabilize soils, create a better traction for tunnel boring machines, and seal up leaking sewer joints, manholes, and laterals. Acrylamide grout was used to encapsulate hazardous waste at the Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee after years of studying various types of products before they ultimately decided on acrylamide. The Toronto Transit Commission, or TTC, currently uses an acrylic chemical grout to curtain grout their subway. They began their grouting program in the mid-90s. In salt, limestone, and potash mines, acrylamide ground has been used to stop water infiltration. Acrylamide ground is used to curtain grout and probe grout underground structures. This is an example of how they use the acrylamide grout to reinforce a section of soil ahead of a tunnel boring machine, or TBM. To get the TBM back on grade, they injected acrylamide in the less dense soil just ahead of the TBM until they reached better soil conditions. In 2008, the city of Dearborn, Michigan was under an EPA mandate to reduce sanitary sewer overflows, or SSOs. Their approach was to install two large tanks to contain waste encountered, I'm sorry, to contain waste. They encountered a substrate pressurized water bearing zone that needed to be stopped using acrylamide before the condition of the tanks could continue. Frank, thank you. Um, I think I'd like for James and for Steve to talk a bit about the challenges they ran into in this project and about the lessons they learned and then I want you to come back in in a few moments and talk about um, the conveyance of this technology and how it's um, how it uh, how it does actually get into large and small diameter pipes. But I'll take the presentation back and I'll advance it for the sake of uh, the next presentation team. And let's talk about this. Steve, take off. Yeah, one of the obvious challenges, Don, is project funding, funding to do this work. Um, there was no hope for Granite City uh, without the IEPA funding. Our firm worked closely with the city to obtain a, a loan uh, worth $8 million. And part of that loan at the time was a 25% forgiveness grant. So the, the city was getting uh, you know, three cents out of four cents on the, of the project uh, as a loan and the rest as direct grant. Steve, so, was that for the entire project and all of the all the construction technology, or just the, the grouting side? That was for the entire project, Don. Yeah, right. Okay. Yep. And um, we found through this project, um, you know, a lot of the uh, damage and cost could be avoided simply with the, the chemical grouting, like James alluded to earlier, the preservation part of it, the maintenance of it. Um, of course, it works well with the CI. PP and SPR and a slip lining, but uh, those standing alone aren't, they don't stop the infiltration. Um, James, I know you can, you can take off on this. Okay. Uh, rain events for, with the American Bottoms here, and uh, touch a little bit on the project side too, but uh, 
our issues is every time when the, uh, especially springtime like right now, we got flooding issues. As this groundwater is going up, these pipes, the infrastructure is doing the same thing. The water comes in, the pipes float up. The groundwater drops, they drop. Soil's gone, pipe disappears sometimes. Uh, so we're really geared or driven on what's going on with the rivers from our rain events and even our upstream rain events that affects our river levels with our groundwater table elevation. Now, one of the big challenges with this uh, Granite City project is this here is all combined sewers. You've got stormwater and also your sanitary. What we actually had in our office trailer support unit was uh, we'd set up with the internet where we could even monitor and watch weather service and see if there was rain coming in, we had to be prepared to get guys out. Um, there was quite an elaborate setup uh, with our site-specific safety plan, uh, inspectors assisting and watching weather conditions on the internet, such as that. Um, one time we did have a fast storm come through. We found out after we had the guys out and everything secured, we actually had a, over an hour time frame on the 84-inch line before water neared concern areas. So it gave us, it was a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know the best terminology to put it, but we were a bit hurried for a little bit until we found out that, okay, yeah, it's not as bad as what we thought. <laughs> and the last item, is that, uh, is that Steve? Yeah, reaction uh, to the discovered sewer conditions and determining the best repair method. Again, you've seen several examples of repair uh, methods, lining, um, SPR lining, the uh, slip lining. Um, and those are good, except it doesn't stop the infiltration. And you'll see here in a few slides later examples of that. But uh, it's, it's something that has to be addressed. And can't stress that enough that this infiltration is, is a big problem in our type of soil conditions. Some of the solutions that um, came up from this project is, is working closely with the contractor, having a good working relationship. Uh, we worked well with uh, Visu Sewer, with James Bones' crew. Um, you know, the, the, you contractors are the experts out there in the means and methods. If you come up with exorbitant uh, methods of cost, well, that's just going to take away from project funding and less work. So it's very important to have that re working relationship with the contractors. Um, we just provide the guidelines and design components. Um, one of the other things that needs to be addressed or is uh, a good solution is get your municipalities, your government agencies uh, on a preservation or maintenance program, um, internal inspection, try to catch this, these problems before they become structural failures. And of course, we all know our aging infrastructure and it's been in the news quite a bit, but it, there's no money to fix everything. It's going to need you know, longer maintenance. So this chemical grouting is proving to be a, a great maintenance item to keep your infrastructures alive and well. Please, uh, please chime in on this on Lessons Learned. Lining doesn't necessarily stop the infiltration. Um, it's a, it's a structural repair, but uh, infiltration keeps occurring. Um, we found, especially in this project, or prior to this project, that uh, lining was the big thing s several years ago, and that was going to stop all the infiltration. Well, we found circumstances that doesn't happen. It, it, groundwater infiltration gets in between the liner and the hose pipe and travels down the sewer main into the manholes. If the manholes are leaking, it infiltrates right into the manholes, bringing the soils in with it, and you've seen pictures of those sinking. So we started lining manholes. And um, again, you got to stop the infiltration. If you don't stop that infiltration, you're just leading into more problems. Here's an example of a CIPP liner. It had infiltration between the hose pipe and the um, liner itself. And the fluctual, the, the movement of the sewer pipe had a, apparently a weak spot in the liner somewhere, started a crack. And here's your infiltration and your reduced capacity from all the fines in it again. Here's, this, a, here's a wet well that was lined using a composite cementitious uh, 
epoxy product, I believe, if I remember right, Steve? That's right, James. Yeah. And uh, here you can see uh, infiltration near the bottom. Uh, Don, if you can move this slide, we've got a close-up of it. Uh, you've got, could be up to 10-minute, 10 10-gallon 10 a minute leak coming through at this one point. This is an old brick structure, uh, pretty much leaking the whole area around. The contractor uh, manhole rehab contractor came in, used uh, hydraulic cement, stopped the water there to where he will put his product in. But here, this next picture, uh, shortly after, groundwater came up, started pushing the liner off the wall. Uh, next picture has uh, got a little bit better view of it, actually cracking the composite product. This uh, manhole rehab contractor actually had to come back in remove the bottom half of this structure. This picture here is uh, our crew in after the fact, chemical grout and acrylamide, basically from the base all the way up and did curtain grouting around this, stopping all the infiltration so they could come back in and uh, install their liner. Uh, this was a uh, warranty type issue. This next slide, uh, is an actual cured in place manhole liner uh, product, not installed by us, but uh, again, these were brick structures leaking. They threw a little bit of hydraulic cement, or maybe the groundwater was low at the time. Uh, groundwater come up and started pushing it off the wall. Don, if you can move to the next one, it's really interesting. Uh, again, brick structure, different one, cured in place manhole liner. It pushed the whole liner off the wall here basic failure of the entire manhole liner. So uh, summarize. Summarize. What, what, what was the, what's the ultimate lesson learned here? Uh, you've got to stop the water. Uh, and even though the water's not coming in today, if you know you're in an area where you've got ground, high groundwater potential around the river bottoms and such as that, you have got to go and stop the water before you can do a good job of lining. And this here slides coming up is a really good example. You know, you've got your water coming into your joints, cracks, your lateral connections, liner comes through. Hey, we got a one-piece pipe from end to end. Really pretty. Uh, next thing we know, we got to go and open the lateral back up so the house will drain. Guess where the water goes? Next weakest point, which is the opening. And uh, now you're you've just isolated where your water is coming from, your lateral connections and also at your manholes. Uh, sure, Steve can go and <laughs> throw that's, some. That's our next uh, project, James. Uh, that's um, something we're working towards is we're going to have to start uh, chemical grouting the laterals. You know, we've sealed the mains, we've sealed the manholes, um, but now the laterals are going to have to be sealed. Excellent. And how that's done in small and large diameter pipe is what we're going to talk about from Frank. And I'm going to make Frank the presenter at this moment, and I appreciate you rolling from here, Mr. Aguilar. Thank you, Don. In this section, we are going to focus on areas of infiltration in the municipal setting. Like Steve and James have mentioned, if you have infiltration coming in, then the, you're not only having to treat all the additional water that's coming in, but you're also eroding the soil surrounding that structure, which will in time cause it to have significant issues. Areas where water can enter into mainline sewers are through the joints of the sewer pipe, through the service lines and lateral connections, and through the manholes and pipe penetrations. But to preface, again, if you have structurally sound pipe or structurally sound structures, you can use chemical grout to stop infiltration. Here's a typical joint sealing operation, a TV seal truck, winch, camera, and remote packer. Grouting operations are generally performed manhole to manhole. In a closer look, the truck operator uses the video camera to locate the leaking joints. The remote packer is positioned at the leaking joint 
the bladders are inflated to seal off the area. And that's the area with the yellow band around it. The truck operator begins pumping acrylamide grout through the leaking joint. The grout travels through the joint into the surrounding soil where the grout collar is formed. The bladders are deflated. The packer is moved off of the joint. The joint is then pressure tested, and you move on to the next joint. As you can see, there is grout in the joint, but primarily the seal is taking place outside of the pipe, and that's where the grout collar is formed. Here is a typical lateral sealing operation, a TV seal truck, winch, camera, and remote lateral packer, grouting ops are performed manhole to manhole. So it's very similar equipment that's used in sewer joint grouting as well as lateral. The, what makes it unique is the lateral packer. In a closer look, the truck operator uses the video camera to locate the leaking lateral in this lined pipe you can see that the water coming into the system after they have reinstated the lateral. The remote packer is positioned at the leaking lateral. The bladders are inflated to seal off the area. The operator then engages the lateral packer element and seals off the lateral. The truck operator begins pumping acrylamide grout and notice the two yellow highlighted areas, which show how the grout is sealing the annular space between the liner and the hose pipe. The grout has traveled through the leaking areas out into the surrounding soil, forming the grout collar. The element is retracted and the bladders are deflated. The lateral packer is moved off the lateral. It is no longer leaking. They move on to the next area. This shows the grout collar that was formed on the outside of the pipe. Grouting underground structures such as a manhole or a wet well can be accomplished by either curtain grouting or crack injection. These are specific additives that you can add to the acrylamide grout to prevent future root growth, extend the gel time, lower the freezing temperature. You can add latex to strengthen the gel. You can add diatomaceous earth to strengthen the gel. Or you can add tracer dyes, as we talked about earlier, to be able to track the grout to make sure that you are getting a good mix of component A and component B. And that way you can also track where your end result product is coming out. And if you see another liquid, you can identify it as water because the water would not have a color. Complementary technology. Uh, as Steve and James have already mentioned, and I'll just drive this point again, if you stop the water first, whatever you do after, whatever technology you decide to use, whether it's spray on a coat or spray on a cementitious liner or put in a different type of liner, the drier that structure is, the more successful and more long-term that process is going to last for you. This was a real group effort between the contractor and the engineering community. Engineers can now specify chemical grouting for the cities that they serve. Some myths and facts about acrylamide. Some people feel that acrylamide will only last two or three years, that it's a Band-Aid, that it's a temporary repair. Uh, we believe um, the complete contrary to that, that this is a long-term permanent repair when the grout is mixed and handled properly, injected properly into good soil conditions. The product will not dehydrate. The grouted mass soil surrounding outside any type of structure, that, well, is there's enough water and moisture in that environment to keep that resin whole. Um, another fact is beginning in 1985, 
in Tennessee, the Oak Ridge Tennessee National Laboratory, with the Department of Energy, began a study to test seven different types of grounds. They chose acrylamide as the product of choice for the Department of Energy to encapsulate hazardous waste at the nuclear waste facility. Another myth is that the EPA banned the use of acrylamide chemical ground. I've been with Avanti for 14 years, and not a year goes by that somebody doesn't call me and say, I wish you guys still sold acrylamide. We have never stopped selling acrylamide. The proposed ban was taken off the table in 2002. The EPA's main concern all along was worker safety, but they were educated on how to handle the material, the steps that were in place for that, and they took the proposed ban off the table in 2002, but the product was never banned by the EPA. I will close with this quote from Dr. Vipu, PhD, PE, Chairman and Professor, Civil and Environmental Engineer at the University of Houston. To date, the only proven method of stopping infiltration is the application of chemical grout. Based on its cost effectiveness, durability, and method of leak repair for sewer pipe joints, manholes, and laterals, chemical grouting has proven to be the least expensive remediation alternative for stopping leaks and infiltration. Thank you, Don. Huh, thank you, Frank. I will uh, I'll take a moment here, take back presentation. And, whoops, that's not possible, or is it? <laughs> um, we have a lot of questions coming in, and they're good questions. I can't wait to get to them, but before we open up the Q&A, um, I, I would uh, certainly like to take a moment to highlight something we deem important. In the announcements leading up to uh, this live learning event, we itemized five takeaways that you would yield from this presentation. Above all else, we want to make sure that we deliver on that promise. In the beginning, we heard Steve talk about the history of the region, the challenges, and the engineering solution. Um, James was good about talking about the full arsenal of construction technologies utilized. Uh, the fact that the cost of chemical grout enabled a wider, a deeper um, scope of restoration of the larger diameter pipes, and it was the cost that allowed that to happen. Um, we heard a bit about the test seal and validate system, and we're going to share with you that entire document from NASCO to help set up that, that new operating standard. And then we heard from both Steve and James that um, cooperation was key critical to uh, a successful project here. Look. Um, we probably have more time than uh, more questions than we have time. I'm looking at the clock right now, but there's too many good questions for me not to go into this and and and, and pull a couple of them out here for the benefit of our our viewing audience. And I go to questions right now, and I will. Yeah. You know, there was a question about gel time. What was the gel time used for the larger pipe diameter, larger diameter pipe? Well, most of the larger diameter pipe, we were running gel time between 75 and 90 seconds. That gave us enough time to fill the void in the uh, packer, plus to be able to force that grout outside to get a good grout soil band around the pipe. Next question. When air testing the joints, what pressure was recorded after the grouting? Pressure was based upon depth divided by 2 plus 4. So basically, if we were running 12 foot, we had 6 plus 4, or 10 PSI test pressure. Well, your answers are just crisp as they should be. Uh, were additives used, such as latex, uh, yes. during the project? Yes, we were running on this project 3% uh, by volume latex, AV257, with a 10% solids mixed AV100. Here's a good question. Um, and are you suggesting that this is an alternative to lining, or must you take on the added cost? Which, meaning, would you add this as an added requirement to the cost of lining? Can I can jump on that one, Don? Yeah, you can. Steve, um, I'm suggesting on these large diameter sewers, the chemical grouting took place of lining. Uh, lining a 96-inch or 78-inch sewer, 
108 inch, I think 96 inch was the largest liner a supplier quoted us. That's anywhere from 750 to $1,000 per foot. If you take that up for 1,000 feet, you're talking 750,000 to a million dollars. The chemical grouting was roughly about 600, 700 dollars a joint, 1,000 feet if we had five foot joint spacing. It ended up being about 120,000 dollars. A significant cost difference. And that chemical grouting is so flexible, the acrylamide works so well that even if the pipe's fluctuating in the groundwater, it's staying with it. And um, the liner for that size of a pipe wouldn't necessarily be structural in that condition anyway. So that chemical grouting took the place of lining in our situation. Can you grout a pipe if there are cracks in the host pipe? Oh, we got a loaded question here. Uh, <laughs> big concern is is when we pull up with our packer element and inflate them packer el uh, elements at each end there to seal at that joint, uh, you stand a really good chance of opening up those cracks. You have to be super careful. Uh, can it be done? Has it been done? Yes. It just takes a lot of caution, a lot of time. Uh, now again, you're not doing a structural repair, you're sealing. At that point, you would be better to come back after you got the water stop and do some type of structural repair, either manhole to manhole CIPP lining, sectional short lining CIPP, something to do a structural repair, because a grout will not do the structural repair. What is the loss? of diameter in a service line. With only four inches to work with with any amount will be significant. Well actually with the grouting you do not have a loss. You might end up with a little bit of residual grout on the inside, but it's it's negligible. Um, actually grouting is less than putting a uh, lateral domain connection lining in. Most of those are running a 3 millimeter to 4.5 millimeter wall thickness. Uh, your EPROS LCRs, your T liners, um, there's quite a few of them out there. All what you're going to have is your residual grout. What the grout that works to seal is outside the pipe. i tell you what, I'm looking through all these questions and they're coming in right and left and I'm looking at the clock at the same time. I'm wondering if this isn't the exact right time to uh, to move to the next step. And that is uh, certainly one more interactive poll question. And then I do want to wrap up the session and ex explain what you can expect as a result and what you'll receive. So let me go to this poll question one more time. And I'm going to launch it right now. And it simply says, you know, how is it? how can we best serve you now? Um, Presenters, are you seeing that, that question? Because I don't see it right now. Yeah. Yes, yes I am. Mr. James. Good. Um, I'm getting about a third of the votes in. And I'm not surprised with what I'm seeing. Good. couple more percent and I'll make this I'll close this out real quick thanks for your opinions I'll share and I can promise you we will act accordingly thank you for sharing this information let me proceed quickly with um, this idea as we wrap up this presentation let me remind you you'll be receiving two documents by email including a recent article on the Granite City project from Underground Construction Magazine. It would have appeared in January's issue. And a new operating standard from, the, from NASCO. And uh, with these, we extend the learning beyond this webinar. Uh, presenters, any parting comments? Steve, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think the biggest thing to take away from this is you know, stop that infiltration. If you stop that infiltration, it's going to be uh, a huge event, an ounce of prevention towards a pound of cure. And James? 
Well, and concurring with what Steve just said, uh, one of the biggest things for municipalities and sewer districts and such as that, you've got to come to realize that their greatest asset is out of sight and out of mind, their infrastructure underground. So they need to start looking at ways of evaluating and maintaining. James, thank you. And Frank. Thank you, Don. Uh, yes, again, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, thank everyone for their, uh, their questions. And uh, we look forward to educating and training uh, anyone in the industry who's at, who has any questions moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, we love uh, teaching what we know and believe about chemical gravity. The only thing we like better is teaching nose to nose, belly to belly. And there's a hands-on training opportunities at Avanti headquarters and throughout the country. You're encouraged to go to avantigrout.com to view additional educational options. And as you exit this webinar, you'll be asked a few questions. If you feel you were well served over this last hour, let us know. We uh, fully intend to be the best in the business with these live learning events, and your feedback will tell us how. So thank you so very much. And until the next time, we'll just say so long. <laughs>